We've had Biden deposed, Kamala elevated in what I can mm -hmm. only explain or only describe as a coup. Polls show it going back and forth. I don't really trust polls to begin with, but what's your prediction here? Who's going to win this election? I don't know. I, I hope Donald Trump. Uh, you know, I, I, I spoke about this earlier this week on it depends on uh, if there is more than 50 percent of the public that hates Donald Trump more than they care about their uh, personal budgets, more than they care about their job. Do they hate Donald Trump more than they fear World War III and possibly nuclear? Do they hate Donald Trump more than they uh, fear the border and see what's going on in the border and see the, um, the absolute radicals that are in bed with Kamala Harris? Do they hate Donald Trump more than they fear communism? I, I think those are, I think that's an astounding hurdle to get over. But with the mainstream media, the way they have, have just given everybody a pass on blatant lies, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, there might be. I don't think there is, but I, there might be. I'm not sure that the people who are the swing voters, meaning like younger people or this sort of unicorn demographic of suburban mm -hmm. women, I'm not sure they even mm -hmm. face that question. I'm not sure they're asking themselves, would I prefer a thriving economy or would I prefer communism? It seems to me that they're voting more on vibes. Yeah, well, that's a problem. Uh, you know, the world's not really run on vibes. Uh, the world is run on intellect and careful study and, uh, and, and history. And if you're if you're going to vote for vibes, well, then we deserve to be destroyed. We really do, uh, because we we will be a menace to the rest of the world if we're just going on vibes. Man, I just I don't know. I just I kind of feel like she's like a winner. That's insanity. And yet that's what we're seeing on TikTok here. OK, I, I want to ask about one of these demographics. Maybe the mainstream media is portraying women to be a stronger voting demographic than they actually are in the sense that the media says women make or break an election. Um, many women are liberal, even women who objectively have been underserved by leftist feminism. And it, it really is a question that Republicans shouldn't dismiss, but sometimes do. Why are so many women liberal? Well, I think that, um, you know, the same reason why uh, men, young men are becoming more conservative. Um, sorry, it goes to biology. Um, Men are the protectors. They're the ones looking over the horizon. And women are, generally speaking, the nurturers. And it takes both of us to be able to form a great society. Somebody who is looking over the horizon, and I think men see over the horizon and say, there is real trouble on the horizon. Women, on the other hand, uh, are the nurturers and see, you know, all of these victims now. And uh, it's, it's generally speaking in the, um, uh, you know, in the wheelhouse of women to be more compassionate. And so with the way things are set now, everybody seems to be a victim and the white man is the bully. And, and so it, is, it makes sense to me that they would be uh, drawn more to a socialist kind of... Uh, uh, place. Um, and I think that's just because we're all living in our lizard brains right now. Everybody, the men are just, something's wrong. We've got to address it. Uh, and the women are in their li lizard brains and they're, they're doing the same thing. They're, we've got to protect it. We have to hold these people close and, and take care of everybody. Um, if I think if, if the media hadn't put us in lizard brain mode, uh, I think this election would be a lot different. People are going to regret the way they voted. I really, truly believe uh, if they vote for uh, Kamala Harris. I, th I think we are possibly done as a nation. I, I don't think there's any way around that. Done as the republic that we know. Uh, imagine Kamala Harris sitting and negotiating with Vladimir Putin or Z or, um, you know, Hamas imagine um, her and sitting down with uh, 
Iran and what policy she would come up with. We, we are in grave, grave danger. She is, she is a Marxist, and quite honestly, I don't think very smart. Um, so, Do you think she is an ideological Marxist? I know her father is a Marxist oh economics yeah. professor. Do you think she is? Yeah, everything that she says is, is a Marxist uh, sort of thing. You know, when we unburden ourselves uh, from the, the past uh, to see what can be. Well, what she's actually saying there is if we just unburden our, our, uh, ourselves from the things we know are true in the past, we can come up with all kinds of reimagining of the police and of, of the economy and everything else. That doesn't make any sense unless you're a Marxist. It's like critical consciousness reimagined just for a political yeah, slogan. Like teach I mean, people to is, look at the world through the lens of Marxism, but call it something else. Correct. Correct. I mean, it is the only way modern monetary theory works. Yeah. And that is something she's a big fan of. Um, and modern monetary theory is, is unburdening yourself from the past. We're not going to look at Zimbabwe. <laughs> Right. We won't look at what happened to the Weimar Republic. We're just going to say this time it's different because we believe in unicorns. It's right. going to end the same way. It is. And by the way, most of my viewers are familiar with modern monetary theory, but it's this wild fantasy idea that debt and deficit don't matter, that it's just you're just keeping a log of what you've spent. But if you need more money, just go ahead and print more money and you can deal with the inflation that that causes by increasing taxes, which is also how you control the people. Biden, Joe Biden had yeah, actually it's actually it's less on taxes and more on price controls. Oh, um, yeah. Well, the, the reason why modern monetary theory can work, they think, is if they have absolute data on where the money's being spent in at any given time immediately, they'll be able to shut it off. This is why, um, uh, you know, the central bank currency is so terrifying. You get into digital currency from the United States Federal Reserve, then they control everything. And so if the price starts to go up, let's say on gasoline, well, are you an essential worker? If not, we're going to make sure that your money no longer works to buy gas. If uh, something is getting really hot on, you know, in the market uh, and, you know, let's just say some widget is, is going up in price, they need to control that. So they'll just shut your currency off. So only the people who they deem absolutely need it can buy it. It is price controls on steroids. It, it's it is. total like control of the economy. The Canadian trucker convoy times a thousand. And when I say taxes, they're yeah. going to use them as social control. They're going to use them as social control to keep people on the U.S. dollar. Because otherwise, obviously, we would all just switch to you know cryptocurrency or gold and silver if we if our money is being devalued. But if you have to pay your taxes in the U.S. dollar, then you're going to have to keep working for you're going to have to keep working for the U.S. dollar in order to yeah. have the money you need to pay taxes. So it's a I mean, and it's totalitarian. I, I the, right. The, the, central, the central bank currency is going to happen when the dollar um, really starts to take it on the chin. And uh, we'll just be so out of control. And there will be an emergency. And the banks will close down for a few days. And then they will rein, reintroduce the dollar as a digital currency. Mm -hmm. And they will say at first... We'll give you, if you join us, we'll give you uh, 120% of your money if you convert over to this. Um, and it may remain that way if you're a, a you know, special person. You're a one-legged prostitute with one eye and you're half Indian. Um, then you, could, you might always get 120%. But if you're a white guy who has been wealthy, you will probably get 80% look it up. This is what Janet Yellen talks about. And that, that number will come down further and further uh, the longer you hold on to your money. But the key on um, digital currency from the Fed, unlike Bitcoin, you can never take it out of the Fed system. So it's always theirs. And if they want to incentivize you, they can add money. If you've done something that they don't like, they can take that money away. The money can have a time expiration. If they need you to spend your money right now, 
They will say, spend your money today because tomorrow there's only going to be half of it left. It's like airline I mean, it's miles, but imagine control. like American Airlines being in charge of all of your finances. Everyone's head would explode after one oh. day. It would be dreadful. Oh, so yeah. you mentioned an emergency is going to precipitate this, this transfer to um, a digital currency. What do you mean by that? Like a black swan event? I mean, we have so many. I mean, it's, it's hard to see the sky from all of the black swans that are in the sky right now. I don't know what kind of event it will be. Um, it could be many things. It could be riots on the streets. Uh, the United States, if we really go unstable, um, uh, that's when the BRICS nations will say, we're, we're uncoupling from their currency. Um, if we continue to spend the way we do, they'll uncouple. Uh, and that would just cause a loss of our you know, world reserve currency status. And we're Mexico overnight. Um, I think uh, war is on the horizon and a very bad war. Um, like with Russia or a civil war? Could happen. Uh, well, I think both could actually happen, but I think we're closer. Well, I can't say that anymore. Um, I, I can't tell you what the world will look like on January 20th. Um, and, and I've done this for, you know, I'm approaching uh, half a century in broadcast. And I started when I was 13 years old, and I have seen all kinds of stuff happen. And for the first time, I cannot predict how this is going to turn out in the next two or three, four months. Mm. By the time we hit January 20th, America could be over. America could uh, be in flames just internally. We could be in the midst of a, uh, of a massive battle uh, throughout the world. We could all be broke. I have no idea. The black swans that are flying in the sky, you'll just look at what's been happening at the convention. You have... Uh, 200, I think it's 219 different radical groups. 60% of them are from out of country. They, they represent all of the worst terrorist groups on the planet. Uh, 144 of these groups have direct ties to the terror, to terrorist group directly and stand by October 7th and think that was totally fine. Those are the people surrounding the DNC. Those are the people that earlier this week, um, Joe Biden said, you know, they've got a good point. Mm. They have a good point. These people are coming in from all over the country uh, or all over the world. And they're countries that hate us. 19 different countries that are really our enemies. Uh, and they're surrounding the DNC and no one's talking about it. You know, I said in 2008 that, you know, communists and uh, anarchists and progressives uh, and uh, Islamists will work together and they will sweep the world into chaos. And they, when they see that moment, they'll strike America. And uh, when I said that, everybody made fun of me because no, the, how are these groups going to work together? Well, they are working together now. And uh, they may not be calling each other up, but they all sense America is on her knees right now before she gets up. We have a weak moment, and they will all say, they'll all say, now, go now you're going to be overwhelmed. It's, it's, it's like new drone wars. You know, that aircraft carrier may be huge, but can it handle 50 or 100,000 drones at once? Probably not. It's terrifying, actually. It also yeah. is like, you see, the, you see these protesters outside of the DNC, and you're just like, why were they allowed to come into our country when each and, each and every one of these individuals has a verifiable trail of ideology that is yes. anti-American, anti-Western civilization, yes. radical Islamist, and anti really anti-humanity. It's remarkable. I mean, I, I said this on the show yesterday. I looked at these protesters and I thought, this looks like a foreign army. It doesn't look like American mm -hmm. citizens exercising their First Amendment it rights. It is a foreign army. And I'll tell you, the 
uh, best thing that could happen for the uh, for the Harris campaign is that they remain calm and don't set Chicago on fire. Um, if if they make news, people will start to investigate who are these people, and it will it it, it will. It will tear the Democratic Party apart. Nobody wants those people on our streets. That's why mainstream media is just saying they're protesters. They're not identifying who these people are. They are way out of the mainstream. Well, it's also, I mean, Kamala Harris is already kowtowing to them, which is why she picked Tim Walls instead of Josh Shapiro, when Josh Shapiro would have been just objectively the more strategic choice since Pennsylvania is probably going to be the state that decides the election. Talk to me about the election in a security sense. I'm fairly cynical about the state of election security because I know that some Republicans and some Republican groups tried to do some things to bolster election security. I don't think they did enough. I don't think they did. I don't think they did enough soon enough. I see no reason why the Democrats wouldn't try to do what they did in 2020 again in 2024, but worse because they're emboldened. Am I being too cynical? (laughs) <laughs> no, um, they're not only um, because they got away with it uh, and they've had four years, they've had four years at the controls. They're in the control room. Um, and the Biden uh, um, executive order that happened that he signed the first week that Congress cannot get any details on that was government wide to make sure that you are working with NGOs uh, to get people to sign up to vote. That has been in the works for four, for four years. No one has any idea who the government is working with in every single governmental department. Uh, I, I think you're going to see uh, fraud at an epic le- level um, and and this is extraordinarily concerning to me because while the party says they're trying to fight misinformation, just the, uh, the speeches on Monday night at the DNC was full of such obvious, and not misinformation, malinformation. They know that this is wrong. It was so full of that, and then they're protecting democracy, and what they're doing is uh, the exact opposite of shoring up anyone's confidence in the vote. Um, I, I, I fear for our country if um, Donald Trump wins, I think they're going to not only question it, they'll say it's a stolen election, they'll do everything they can, and they will set the streets on fire. If Kamala Harris uh, wins, I don't think the people on the right, I know I will have a hard time believing it unless it's just razor thin close. Um, I still will question, um, but you'll have a hard time convincing me that the American people did this uh, to themselves. But maybe. But what happens uh, when people no longer believe on either side that the vote is legitimate. I know I hate that. And I feel like we're in a we're in a place where these questions are legitimate. They're rational. You have to be blind not to ask them. But I hate that we live in a time right now where we do have to ask these questions. So if Donald Trump does win, though, and of course, I agree with you, I think the left is going to set streets on fire. They're going to question it. They're going to claim, you know, Russia or somebody did it. I mean, they they set the playbook already for what they're going to do. But they have an additional weapon in their arsenal this time because they have these convictions. They have these this lawfare against Trump. Do you think it's at that point that they will try to actually put Trump in prison? I think they might do it before then. I mean, really? I think this judge in New York, he's going to come out in September. I think they're going to try to do it even before. Um, and if they do, uh, again, they will be setting people's hair on fire. You have to ask yourself. Um, what is the benefit to, to poke people over and over and over and over again um, and, and try to get them to react? You know, Joe Biden says he's a uniter. There's no way he's a uniter. Nobody's even talking about what can unite us. 
and that is the Bill of Rights and actually meaning what you say, not saying, you know, hey, we're for justice for all and then having a two tier justice system. Uh, We're for democracy and the rule of law and then doing what they're doing. The, the, The United States government, the federal government has no place in signing people up. It is absolutely 100 percent unconstitutional. They don't care. They don't care. Why wouldn't you go and root out the problem in uh, in the Secret Service? Why would you, if if you weren't involved in it, and I'm not saying that they were, but you certainly, if you're trying to create a country that is united and secure, you would never handle the investigation of the attempted assassination on Donald Trump the way they are. They're doing nothing to instill confidence and doing everything to go the opposite direction. And they're ju- the lies are so remarkable when they come out and say and question the Supreme Court because they can't get their way. And they question the Supreme Court and accuse the Supreme Court of strengthening the presidency so Donald Trump can be a dictator. That is the exact opposite of almost everything that has come out of the Supreme Court in the last two years. They are weakening the administrative arm, and they should continue to do that. Yeah, I mean, you ask this question of what's going to happen if you keep if you keep poking people, what's the end goal? That's actually what when I think that they will try to imprison Donald Trump. I don't know whether it's going to be before the election. I don't know if it's going to be after the election. I don't think that they're going to do that until they want violence, until they want. The left right now is kind of famous for claiming that conservatives want a civil war, and they're doing this to prepare the country because they're the ones that actually want a civil war so that during that chaos and that violence, they can come in and they can seize controls under the guise of providing security and then impose their communism on us. They're going to use putting Trump in prison to be that moment. That's the black swan that I have my eye on because there's going to be yeah, the, the, some crazy conservative who commits some act of violence because that person is crazy, but also has righteous indignation over the injustice that's been done to Donald Trump on our behalf. And they're going to use that person to demonize all of us as basically terrorists and seize control of everything. So the one thing that everybody has to take a breath on is, first of all, if there's a civil war in America, there isn't one country on planet earth except maybe israel um that will come to the defense of the conservatives not one we will be known as rebels outlaws horrible human beings that just want death and destruction for all children and you know whatever um look at what's happening in england in england is exactly what is happening here we are flooding uh, the country with God only knows whom. They do not have our same values. They don't have, they don't have any intention of, of becoming American. Maybe some do, but the vast majority most likely do not. Um, it's, it is causing uh, unrest in our streets. It is causing us to uh, print even more money. We are taking our uh, homeless and just saying shoo while we replace them with this new homeless uh, uh, group of people that are getting five-star hotels. They're getting fed every single day. Why would you do that? Well, that's what the people in Great Britain are asking. And there are some bad elements that are, have been asking that as well. But the vast majority of people are saying, you're destroying our country. What are you doing? They, every time they go to vote, they get, they get more of the same. They're told, you know what, we're going to correct it this time. And then it's more of the same, if not worse, the next time. At some point, you have a real problem on your hands. Uh, and all of the Western countries strangely, are passing exactly the same laws. They're handling their population exactly the same way. So where's that coordination coming from? Uh, and what are they going to do? Well, we're, we'll, we'll see what they're doing in Great Britain. 
They are shutting everyone down, and Great Britain has the balls to say at this point, no matter where you are, not in Great Britain, in the world, no matter where you are, you will pay for misinformation. They wow. said if you tweet, even if you tweet, and then you're in another country that they'll come after you. Like, I tweeted out after that. I was like, get lost, loser. The last time you tried to do that to us, we broke into a new yeah. country and, and you went home crying in shame. I don't know if people have the same spirit that they had in 1776 to fight back against that tyranny now. No. I don't know if the, if the infiltration of our institutions has been so complete that even if there is a large number of people who have that fighting spirit, if they could accomplish it. And I want to go back and ask you about this as it relates to the Secret Service. You said, I don't know if the Secret Service is in, was involved in the Trump assassination. What do you mean by that? I mean, there is some, there's some <laughs> red flags about that event to me that I hate to even ask the question, did they allow this to happen? But how do you not ask that question given the circumstances and the facts on the ground? I think if you're a reasonable human being, you have to ask that question. It doesn't mean you answer it um, one way or the other um, uh, with conviction because we don't have any information to go off. All we have is a bunch of red flags that look really bad. Does that mean that it, was, it wasn't just incompetence? Maybe, but our government is so incompetent that it's possible that it was just incompetence. However, um, I talked to Gerald Posner this week. Um, he really is the leading authority probably on the Kennedy assassination. And um, I asked him, what does your gut say? Remember, we don't have any facts, so we're just speculating here. What does your gut say? And he said, his gut says that there's at least a uh, Peter Strzok uh, element that some of the people, and it may be one, maybe two, some of the people in the um, Secret Service might not have planned it or plotted it, but definitely were also not planning uh, in the most effective way to keep it from happening. You know, there's a crime of omission and commission, and uh, uh, the crime of omission is probably the most likely that you know we don't like him so we don't care you know if you believe he's hitler why wouldn't you why wouldn't you um and i i think that the deep state um does not go after the people who look at donald trump the way they do you know people don't understand the world economic forum and everything that I've written about the Great Reset is here. It's happening. Um, and if you, if you get Donald Trump in, he will stop that from happening. Uh, and they can't allow that. They can't. They are too far down the road. You must stop Donald Trump. Otherwise, what the World Economic Forum has going, and it's almost completely engaged at this point, it will all fall apart. And he's not going to play that game. He believes in country first. So what do it's, you do? It seems like for the Secret Service, the crime of omission is DEI, too. Yes. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the short person, I don't care if it's a female or male or whoever, First of all, the thing that you do, uh, and look at, uh, look at the detail around um, uh, Putin. Many of them look like Putin, okay? Yeah. If you are a detail, you have people who are the same size and the same shape as the protectee, and they have to be at least as tall because if you are rushing him out, and you're a head shorter than he is, well, I have a headshot. You have to have your security detail be able to cover that man entirely. Th that's irresponsible. Then we find out earlier this week, or was it last week, uh, that uh, during one of the other events, I think this was for... I 
think this was actually for Kamala. The no, it was Trump again. Uh, the person that was in charge of the detail to make sure that everything is buttoned up, as the cars are coming in, she goes and breastfeeds her baby with her family in a secure area. How did they get in? And why in the world would you put somebody in charge that is breastfeeding their baby on site? That's after an attempted assassination, you still do that? We have no sense at all, no common sense, no common decency, no spirit of, um, of honor and integrity. If you're in that role, you say, you know what, I, breastfeeding is very important to me, and I know we have policies that I can still stay, you know, um, at the Secret Service while I'm breastfeeding, but I should not be leading that detail. At this time, it will put the protectee in danger. It's all about me, 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 me. Well, when, when you implement or impose DEI, that's going to cause chaos. Chaos breeds violence. Mm-hmm. So to me, that mm-hmm. is implicit permission for that violence to happen. Obviously, it was just a couple of days after this assassination attempt that Joe Biden was unceremoniously booted as presumptive nominee. The incumbent just kicked to the curb. Who do you think was behind that? Because it's not like, I mean, you and I sitting here, everyone watching, listening knows that it's not like Biden was like, you know what? I'm just not cognitively up for the job anymore. I'm going to retire. I'm going to walk off in the sunset. Somebody forced him out. Was it Jill? Was it Barack? Was it Pelosi? Who was it? I think you have to ask a bigger question. Who's running the country? Mm -hmm. Who's actually the president? You know, when, when we found out that Joe Biden hasn't had a cabinet meeting since last October... Who is? Who's putting things together? Who's issuing the marching orders? Who's coordinating? Or is it just all of the cabinet? They're just individuals that nobody knows their name. Nobody elected them. Do you know who sent the um, aircraft carrier and the uh, secondary fleet out to join the sixth fleet in the Mediterranean? It was, it was the Secretary of Defense. It wasn't the President. It was the Secretary of Defense. You mean the guy who was on vacation and didn't tell anybody he was on vacation? That guy who's still in charge? The guy who was responsible for um, uh, the execution of Afghanistan? Yeah. He just decided we're sending another fleet out for the Sixth Fleet. Are you, are you kidding me? That is the president's job. Who is running the country? I, I, I could, if I knew that answer, I could tell you exactly uh, who uh, coordinated this coup. Um, I personally think the answer is pretty clear on who's running the country, um, but I could be wrong. It seems to me that at the very least, Barack Obama is a conduit. I don't know if he's the one giving the marching orders, but it seems to me that he's the one with the direct control over the executive branch of the government. Agree 100%. Agree. You know, he said in 2020, his dream would be, <laughs> uh, he said this, I think, on Colbert or something, his dream would be to be able to not run for a third term or a fourth term, but to be able to have somebody that is the president and he's just behind the scenes directing everything. Well, I think that's what's happening. Dreams do come true, Barack, I guess, Mm. when you uh, make them happen. Okay, last question for you. This is not political. This is cultural. I was surprised the other night, right before I go to bed. You know how we all rage tweet right before we go to bed? (laughs) I posted a meme that I thought was hilarious, and I'm going to show it to you. This meme is a survey of what hobbies women find to be most unattractive in men. I actually don't know if it's a meme or if it's a real survey. There was no citation. I just thought it was funny because it had like collecting figurines and bird watching (laughs) and the most unattractive. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay. So this is in descending order. Bird watching, comic book collecting, taxidermy, 
building model trains, gambling, online trolling, magic tricks, collecting figurines, and the most unattractive hobby for men, according to women, is playing video games. <laughs> And I thought this was hilarious, and I tweeted, this is 100% true, men playing video games is peak unattractive, beyond red flag, like, deal breaker zone, and it's weird that so many dudes don't get this, and Glenn, I gotta tell you, I, while I'm sitting here right now, 6 million people have viewed this tweet, I'm getting ratioed, like, like ratioed more than ever before, I think, 15,000 people are angry at me on X right now for posting this, am I wrong? Now, I don't want to be ratioed, so I don't <laughs> No, you have to, you have to no, take part think, in this now. <laughs> I, I think I hear, I hear men say, now, this is different than playing video games. If that's your hobby, that's your thing, uh, I would be telling my daughter, no, don't marry him. Don't marry Why? him. Why? Why, though? Uh, Why? Collecting figurines, however, I think I would probably be saying the same thing. Honey, mm-mm. <laughs> Uh, but uh, to me, in my mind, now I'm from a different generation, in my mind, when, uh, let's just put it this way, in my mind that says that you haven't grown up yet. Mm. Now, that's from an older generation, but that would to me be like, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your hobby? I like to get up and watch cartoons. I'm sorry, but uh, you know that's it's not a consumptive. Ha- it's a consumptive habit, right? It would be like if women and I. A lot of men interpreted this as an insult, and I didn't actually intend this as an insult. I thought it was a humorous right. observation of human nature because so many women agree with it, and so many men don't understand it. And I, I was surprised actually that so many men were um, so hurt and insulted by this. Guys, don't be so sensitive. You can catalog all of my faults, send them to me, and I will logically analyze whether you're correct or not. Um, but I don't know. It's a consumptive I, I'm, habit. I'm it's like speaking. if a woman says my ho- my hobby is TikTok or online shopping, I'm stealing that from someone else. Someone yes. had a great tweet that said that. But that's not attractive for a woman. This is the same kind of consumptive hobby. Correct. Correct. It, and it is also um, addicting. It doesn't mean you're yeah. addicted to it, but it is very addicting. It's it's like alcohol, the internet, games. You can lose yourself in those yeah. things and. Um, I don't know. Uh, reality is frightening enough. Uh, and there's, at this point, you know, it reminds me of something that uh, Thomas Jefferson said. I'm uh, sorry, Ben Franklin said. I can no longer be friends with people at frivolous parties because they're talking nonsense and the times are too serious. Mm. And I, I kind of feel like that. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm an absolute bummer at parties because <laughs> I, uh, I'm like... This is cool and everything, but do you guys know what's happening around the world? It's really time to grow up and to spend a few minutes at least every day educating yourself on what's going on because you're about to lose your ability to uh, play the video game of your choice or to, um, you know, to stop somebody from plugging you into a video game where you totally. are stuck there for the rest of your life. Totally. This is what I said to the. This is what I said to the, all of the men who actually were kind of substantiating my point because they were acting like I was shanking their identity. So if your identity is video games, you're kind of proving my point here. But I said women find attractive in men. You know, men's role is to protect, provide, produce, and procreate. And any hobby that either increases your competence at these things or demonstrates to women your existing competence at these things, that's what women are going to find attractive. And anything that's opposite, that shows us that you don't care about those things or you're not well qualified for those things, we're not going to find attractive. That's really it. So, I mean, and the question is what women find attractive. Not true, but attractive. You are looking for some, I mean, it's, it's biology. You are looking for someone to mate with, okay? Whether you're thinking that or not, that's what's happening in your body. You become attracted to somebody, um, that's what's happening in your body. And human nature is, don't procreate with a man that is weak. Don't do it. And it just, video games, whether it's true or not, has a, an image of 
somebody 30 years old sitting in their underpants with mom upstairs <laughs> while they're playing a game. That right. is what comes to mind. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. Perception is reality. Yeah, and that's not even taking into account um, what video games, I guess, the side effects. Like, it leads to more aggressive behavior and mental health issues and desensitization of violence and all that stuff. All right, Glenn, this was great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. God bless.